I am Wes Meller. We are Chesapeake Goat Farms, a sixth generation dairy farm. We started out as a conventional farm, milk cows, did row crops, trying to get close to that consumer dollar and the value added movement. We have shifted into the value added side of things. Cheese, butter, yogurt, beef, hay and straw, the equine market, and we also do cut flowers. We think we're in an ideal location for doing this direct sales. We're not in the Midwest where land is cheap. We've got lots of people around us. We're 45 minutes to Philly, 45 minutes to Baltimore, an hour to DC, three hours to New York City. There is a tremendous amount of people around us that have money to spend and are looking for a quality product. A little bit on our structure, mom and dad own things. They bought the farm from the family in 2000, started the business as Chesapeake Gold Farms. We started the value added line in 2008. We have eight full-time employees, seven part-time employees. Majority of them are on the production side of things, with whether it be milking cows, growing the crops. My wife and dad take care of most of the cheese things. I oversee all the dirty, stinky things. It's kind of the, the short of it. So if it has to do with the cows or the crops, that's kind of my side of things. This is a picture of the family. Family's very important, like most farms. Dad's full-time on a farm. Mom is an off-farm school teacher. Somebody's got to get insurance. Uh, and scout for part-time employees for us is kind of the running joke. And then Rhett's our mascot, the dog there. Uh, just picture some of our cheese in the barn there and everybody. Uh, we are not a traditional startup. We were already an established business looking for ways to get into other things. So most startups, you make a product in your kitchen, give it to your friends, move on to production. For us, we already had the milk. We were looking at trying to get into things differently. Dairy is very, very challenging to get into, very expensive. Um, rather than putting a couple million dollars into a processing plant, we went ahead and went the route we are using private label production. So we send our milk out and get it turned into our products. It was a way for us to get into the market, build a brand, establish a customer base without taking on that huge, huge capital debt and let us focus on what, we're, what we feel we're good at, farming and marketing. Some more pictures of our cheese. 2008, we're five years into things, um, is when we got into it. We have had exponential uh, growth over the years and are continuing to grow and have added products on kind of almost every year as uh, customers are looking for, for more and more stuff. Our sales model, we kind of do a little bit of everything. Uh, we're very close with our banker. They like to see us every month, so we try to get as much as many avenues as we can. We're in over 50 different retailers. We do all of that distribution ourselves. It takes a tremendous amount of work. Uh, we do direct to customers. Uh, that's kind of why Amanda's not here today. She's gonna be at a brewery today doing a tasting. Uh, we offer online sales. We can ship all, all across the US. And then we do some on-farm things and classes. Uh, we'll go to some different school functions and church things. Uh, just really trying to get involved in the community and get that product in front of people. So some of the things I think that make us better than the rest, we understand where things come from. We have, a, we have that touch on quality, kind of like Kim was talking about, big business selling to big business. You lose that personal touch and that ability to adapt and shift and change. Um, I mean, we're growing and getting bigger, but if somebody calls and says, hey, uh, I need an extra five, five blocks, or can you do this? It, we have that flexibility. People trust farmers, so, and uh, we think that's pretty important and want to continue to keep that trust. Amanda has 10 years of cheese making experience. She has been all across the U.S. and Canada. She ran the University of Delaware Creamery for a period of time. So we, we kind of think we know, we know what we're doing and uh, can troubleshoot and make a better product for you. I went to Penn State, got a degree in animal science. I've been there all my life. Uh, it, it really is, when you say it's in your blood, it's your passion, it, it truly is. So. And there's different farms that are doing similar things to what we're doing. These are some of them highlighted here. Um, we think we take a little bit more flexibility and make it happen approach, which helps. And there's such a large customer demand. Even, even if they all do great, there's room for us to do, do well also. There's just so much market out there we haven't begun to scratch the surface. Just the whole Maryland or whole value added producer side outside of dairy. So I think everybody in our class could, could appreciate that. Uh, these are some pictures of some of the different 
cheeses that we are competing against. Uh, every once in a while we get people that confuse them with our label. Uh, some more pictures from around the farm. Uh, CAIC program was a tremendous class. I really give kudos to Emiliano for putting it together. Uh, it has been a wonderful, wonderful resource, both from the, all the speakers we had in our classes, giving the presentations, being able to reach out to them, the networking within the class with the different producers. It's really nice to be able to bounce ideas off of like-minded people that are going through the same struggles as we are. The founder track has wonderful, wonderful information in it. I recommend everybody look at it if you're not familiar with it. The field trips were really insightful. We're in the process of trying to get hooked up with Redner's, which we went to as a class and start offering our yogurt in there, hopefully. What's our next goal here with this? Um, like I said, we were a traditional farm uh, looking at commodity-based stuff. We are trying to shift into a larger percentage of value add and eventually get to all direct marketed product. So that's going to mean really changing our herd dynamic. We're currently 160 cow herd with all manual labor. We're looking at shrinking that herd down, putting robotics in, cutting the labor force down, and really focusing on the value added side of things. Uh, we would like to put a creamery in and start processing our own milk as opposed to sending it out. Um, we think we have really, really good products right now, but we're getting a lot of interest in other products that our suppliers don't have the ability to make right now. And we think we could, we could really you take the finances out of it. Um, tremendous opportunity there. Until we get to that point, we're going to continue pushing this current model, growing our sales, getting a bigger name for ourselves, try to start shifting that, that structure into business. We can't just flip a light switch and, and convert this commercial farm into a, a production farm. So we're working towards that. Trying to pick up grocery stores, restaurants. Uh, we're really finding that that small mom and pop business that we've been going after as a retailer is a wonderful customer. It takes a tremendous amount of labor on our end to go and deliver those units to 50 or 100 different people. So look at those bigger stores. We just picked up a restaurant that's, they're gonna take between three and 400 pounds of cheese every, every two weeks. So we're super excited about that. Uh, and entertaining, getting hooked up with a distributor, potentially. Uh, my name is Jeff Smith. Uh, I'm the owner and roaster at Iron Skillet Coffee, a limited liability corporation where we roast coffee in a cast iron skillet. Um, I started this venture about 10 or 12 years ago. I moved to Berlin about 10 years ago, where there used to be a coffee shop that roasted coffee in Berlin. Uh, Jason Hagee would roast coffee on Tuesdays, and every other Wednesday I went and bought a pound of fresh roasted coffee. Um, it was the best coffee I'd ever had, uh, partly because he roasted it to the darkness that I really liked, but also partly because I got fresh coffee every other week. I mean, it was as fresh as you could get. When he closed down, I shopped around. I went to other local roasters. I went to the grocery store. I tried to find another coffee that would match that fresh, uh, bold coffee flavor that I was looking for, and I couldn't find it. So then I thought about what I was going to do, because I had been drinking coffee for about 35 years. I'm 51 years old. I've been drinking coffee for a long time. And I like coffee. Most people that like coffee like coffee. I like coffee. And I wanted that flavor that I was getting, and I couldn't find it. And I remembered back in 2010, I had been to Ethiopia. My daughter was born there, and in 2010, I went to Ethiopia. And uh, the orphanage where she lived uh, performed a traditional Ethiopian coffee ceremony. And what happens in a traditional Ethiopian coffee ceremony? Uh, the youngest female member of the household actually roasts coffee in a pan in the living room of the house. Um, you get to smell the fresh roasted coffee. They take the beans, they crush them, they put them in a special coffee brewery. And then you get to drink the coffee. And it's a really wonderful ceremony because in Ethiopia, coffee isn't just a commodity, it's part of the culture. E coffee, most of you may know, was discovered in Ethiopia. Probably not by a goat herder, but still, that's where it was first grown. So flash forward a few years, and I'm thinking about roasting my own coffee. And I looked around for coffee machines for roasters that I could buy, and they were all pretty expensive. I mean, the cheapest home roaster you can buy at the time was probably a couple of grand, which is a lot of money for a guy that really just wanted to drink coffee every day. And so I remembered back seeing this woman roast coffee in a fire in her living room. And I thought, 
I've got a cast iron pan, and I know cast iron pans are really good roasters, so why not try it? So I bought a pound of beans on Amazon, and I got in my kitchen, and my wife was very unhappy because the whole house filled with smoke. But what happened was I produced a really, you know, a little bit, and the beans weren't great, but they tasted good, and they had that fresh flavor that I really liked. So for the next four or five years, every couple of months, I'd set up a cast iron skillet and a camp stove on my back porch, and I would roast beans for my wife and I to have fresh coffee for a couple of months. Flash forward a few years, 2020 comes along, I'm out of work, there's a pandemic. I used to do writing, I used to do a lot of tech stuff, I used to uh, repair computers and phones. All of those things were drying up. I wanted something to do, and I suggested to my wife, what if I tried to sell the coffee? And she said, sure, why not? So I called up the economic and business development uh, director in Berlin, Maryland, where I live, uh, and Ivy Wells said, sure, set up a table at the farmer's market, and I did. First week I was there, I roasted uh, 30, 15 pounds of coffee, and if you go back and see my table back there, you can taste the coffee, but you'll see a little skillet back there, and that's the skillet that I started with. It's a little nine inch uh, Dutch oven. And I roasted 15 pounds of coffee and I bagged them in half pound bags. I had 30 pounds of coffee on the first market that I ever went and I sold all 30 bags of coffee. It was shocking to me. The next week and I immediately, that Sunday, I had to order more coffee because I didn't have enough green beans for the next week. So I ordered more beans, the next week sold out again. All right, so this is obviously something that other people like besides myself. But I also realized a couple of things in that first month of selling coffee. I realized three really important things. One, I really like roasting coffee. It is fun, it's enjoyable. You get to take something that was grown in a whole other country. And we're talking thousands of miles away because coffee's not grown here. And I get to turn it into something that's almost magical. I mean, these are little green beans. And when you put them in a pot and you put heat on them, they become something stupendous. I mean, it's hard to describe. And if you drink coffee, you know what I mean. So that was the first thing I discovered. And the second thing I discovered was that it was, it was a product that could sell and people liked it as much as I did. And the third thing I discovered and realized was that coffee is part of a bigger community. The beans themselves are grown in high mountain regions in a part of the country that's far away from here by farmers that probably make less money per day than you and I make in an hour. Um, so I wanted coffee to be part of a, the coffee that I made. I wanted it to be part of this community. And Berlin is a great community. These are three of my good friends right here. I actually set up my market right down the street from, from the buzz meter in my first table. Um, what I knew was that coffee needed to be part of a community because coffee already is part of a community. It's a value added product, that's why we're here. It's grown by farmers far away. But the other thing I realized was that my part of the coffee community wasn't just me, I wasn't making an end product. I was actually making a product that somebody had to take and do something else with it to turn it into the thing that they wanted. So. Not only am I a value-added product, but I'm actually part of the value-added community because my product can actually be given to someone else and someone else adds value to it. So what I realized, and, and then I started going to grocery stores and, and looking around and trying to see how I could fit my product into various markets. And if you've ever been to a grocery store, you see the grocery stores are filled with coffee from Starbucks, from Pete's, uh, eight, eight o'clock coffee, uh, there's some I don't know, various, but they're big, they're big names and they're good coffees. They're not local coffees. You don't really find a lot of local coffee in your grocery store because most people don't buy local roasted coffee in a grocery store. They find local roasters. But the other thing is that most people don't buy their coffee in the grocery store. They go to the store, they go to a coffee shop to buy their coffee. They go to places that have already made it so they don't have to do it at home. So if I want to make a product that more people can drink and I want to make a lot of it, I realized right off the bat that the way to do that was not necessarily to try to hit the retail market. I don't want to sell individuals coffee. I want to sell whole batches of coffee. So my goal was to try to produce as high quality coffee as I can, but make it so that it's part of a broader community. And that meant wholesale, which is really part of the program that I'm in here. This, the, the, this growth program helped me realize that the focus of my business and where I wanted to go, if I wanted to focus on what I love to do, which is roast coffee, then what I need to do is roast coffee and try to wholesale it. So that's what I've done. Um, the whole process of building iron skillet coffee has been a big experiment because I roast in a skillet. That's a, that's a five gallon pot right there. That's my new production skillet. And I can roast five and a half pounds of beans in that skillet. 
I turn the beans by hand, it takes about 15 minutes, but they're really good beans. This is uh, my pride and joy, this is my custom cooling box. If you know anything about coffee roasting, coffee roasting, the heating of the coffee beans is really important, but coffee is a food. And it's like, uh, it's like a steak. If you take a steak off of a grill, it keeps cooking, right? And a lot of times you take the meat off the grill a few minutes early because you want it to sort of continue to cook. But with coffee, when you take it off the heat, you want it to stop cooking. So you have to cool it as quickly as possible. Most big commercial coffee roasters include giant fans with big cooling things because really the cooling of the beans is just as important as the roasting of them. So I built a custom uh, cooling box made out of a stainless steel, 55 gallon stainless steel drum. And when my beans are cooked, I dump them in the drum and they cool in two and a half minutes. It's a pretty nice system. Uh, so everything that I've done has been, has been an experiment and has been part of trying to build Iron Skillet into a larger coffee community. The other thing that has happened as part of this program is I realized that what I'm doing, because it's all an experiment, it isn't just about roasting coffee. It's also about becoming an innovator in the industry of coffee roasting itself. There are four people in the world that roast coffee commercially in a cast iron skillet. All four of them started after the pandemic and only one of them is still operating. So it's, it's a unique process. Um, and so what I have done is work with uh, a, some engineering students at Rutgers University to actually design a, a coffee roasting machine that will roast coffee in a cast iron pot. Uh, and this is the, the early prototype of the design. And the idea is to take the very principle that I use, which is to simply uh, apply heat uniformly to a cast iron skillet, turn the beans somehow in a pot, which is the engineering nightmare, an automatic bean stirring machine is not something that anyone has developed before, so I'm working on it. But um, what Iron Skillet seeks to do is two things. One, I want to be a really a, a powerhouse in the world of regional coffee roasting. I want to supply coffee shops in the Berlin and the Delmarva region with the best quality coffee they can. And I want to sell to the rest of the world who wants to have a really great local regional roaster without having to spend $25,000 on a machine that you're gonna get in 12 months, I wanna sell them a, a unit that will allow them to do the same thing that I do with a lot less money and you can just jump right in and start roasting coffee. So there you go, that's where I am. This has been a really great program that has really helped me focus because I have never done this before. I came from writing and technology. I'm not a business guy. I barely understand numbers, but this program and has and the previous program, because I was in the, the initial program, have helped me really understand all of these aspects of businesses that go in this and have helped me focus on what I really want out of coffee and what I really want to make out of my company. Um, and it's been a really great experience. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, my name is Brady, like he said. Hope is over there. Wave your hand, Hope. Namesake of the company. Back in 2014, she was a stay-at-home mom making different kinds of food products out of the house just to bring in a little extra income. And one of those food products was a cupcake. And let me tell you, to this day, I have people like, are these Hope's cupcakes? And I'll be like, no, they're not Hope's cupcakes. She doesn't do that anymore. Uh, I don't know that I'm going to waste the calories on them then. Uh, so one of those cupcakes was a... Uh, a vanilla cupcake with a caramel core of all things and a salted caramel buttercream frosting. It was just absolutely delightful. Um, and I had taken in a couple extra of them to work because, you know, the buyer, the consumer buys 20, but the batch makes 24. Uh, so I'd take a couple extra to work and one of my coworkers was like, can I just get the caramel core on this? Uh, and it's been really caramels ever since. Prior to that, it was cupcakes and cakes and sugar cookies. Sugar cookies were the worst. Um, uh, because, you know, that royal frosting has to dry for a while. And then another layer of royal frosting goes on, and it's all over the house. Um, so uh, we ended up doing uh, caramels. And caramels was great because it didn't have to look pristine. It wasn't, um, <clears throat> it wasn't, it didn't have to be exact. It just had to really taste good. So we've been doing this since 2014. Uh, here, apparently, our slideshow hasn't caught up with our recently researched information. Oh, we actually go back to 2014. It is just the two of us we incorporated back in 2019 uh, as a S-Corp. 
Uh, we do employ a bunch of people, well, maybe a small amount of people, mostly family, uh, real close with the mother-in-law, um, uh, her aunt, uh, you know, different people like that, their friends. Uh, we produce, uh, we actually produce in Westchester, Pennsylvania right now. We have been struggling to find a production space down in Delaware, and most of the open space is either a restaurant, and who wants to pay $25 a square foot times 4,000 square feet, uh, we're currently operating in 300 square feet, by the way. <laughs> so that's a big jump for us and high retail dollars. Um, and so we've been struggling to find uh, a place down in Delaware where we're actually incorporated. Uh, but we produce three products, and uh, the primary product is this soft caramel. There's plenty of them for you to taste today. Uh, we also do caramel lollipops now and the caramel nut squares where we uh, join together uh, different nuts with our soft caramel. Uh, so our soft caramels come in uh, a number of different flavors. It's not like the Werther's, the hard caramels like you'd expect. Um, it's a soft caramel, and it's not like the Brock's, which is maybe what you're thinking about as a chewable caramel. Those are still pretty hard. Uh, this is a much softer caramel. Um, we have six basic flavors there you see, um, and then a number of uh, different seasonal flavors that we rotate throughout the year. And then we have the nut squares, which come with either uh, cashews or with pecans. Uh, our pe pecans mimic a turtle, so it has a thin layer of chocolate caramel as well as the classic caramel and the pecans. It's really a, a, a great seller. Um, and then the lollipops come in uh, four different flavors. We are hoping to, uh, to launch a, a shelf-stable caramel sauce sometime in the future. It's been a product that's been very hard for us to get around. You know, we're clean candy. Uh, I, a lot of people are like, ah, sugar. Uh, but we really use clean ingredients, so it's ingredients you'd recognize from your own house. We could, we could uh, mimic these uh, probably in your kitchen. Uh, so we, uh, uh, we do the best we can to source locally. Uh, some of the competitive advantages, our soft caramel is a richer, deeper flavor. Uh, you look at some caramels that you find that are kind of in the soft caramel category. They're gonna be pale, they're gonna be yellow. Uh, you'll see from ours, it's a deep, rich caramel color. And we come by that naturally. It's slow cooked. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a quick process. You flip over the ingredient labels on some of these caramels, and you're going to quickly read it's sugar, it's coloring, it's flavoring. Like, what, why do you need flavoring? Like, it's, you just burn the sugar. You got yourself some good stuff, right? And, and it's not mass produced like the other stuff. Uh, it's a soft caramel. It is gluten free. Nothing artificial, everyday ingredients. Uh, our direct national competitors like Bouquet, Abdullah, McCray's, Dutch House, Annie Bees, if you've seen any of those, they don't have a lot of penetration in this area. Um, we go to a lot of places and they may be in some of your specialty markets, uh, scattered here and there, some of the places maybe that uh, me and our, uh, the rest of the cohort are trying to get into, but it's really not places that are reaching the masses. And yet we find that even though they're not in the mass, mass areas, uh, that our caramels are quickly adopted by the consumer. Uh, so let me give you an example, for instance, of the Philly Flower Show, which we were recently at, um, as how customers are just kind of adopting our product and why we really need to scale up. We can produce uh, maybe six vats a week. Uh, to give you a reference, six vats is 140 pounds or something like that. Um, it's not a whole lot. Um, for the Philly Flower Show, we had 10 selling days. We had 185,000 people come through the show. That's not even through our booth. Our booth was probably less than that. Uh, we, I actually worked 28 days straight uh, once we got into that. Uh, but to give you some numbers, that's, so here's the thing. This is how we wrap caramels, right? <laughs> Hope does that. The wrists start to hurt after a while. Uh, it is a laborious process. It is a laborious process. We had 90,000 wrist wraps um, to do that. Um, and, but we came out with 1,400 sales, which was great. We just, it was a fantastic event for it. People from Ottawa to uh, the South, people were, had come up from South Carolina even, they were loving the product. 
Um, we had a sale for every 131 people. If you think of a household as 1.3 people, uh, because most of the people coming through were like retirees or singles or something like that, um, we had a sale for every 100 households. So if you operate and you're thinking in your business, the households that come through your business, right, uh, what something like that would look like. Uh, that's $121 per thousand people. It's just fantastic for us. Um, and here are some of the great reviews. Like, they were kind of at the end of the spectrum, but they all meant the same thing. They meant thank you very much. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we, it, we had some really great, uh, really great adoption there at the, at the event. So much so that one of the things, you know, our, our sales channels currently are direct to customers, both online and face-to-face -face and wholesale. And we've struggled from getting these type of events, which think of it like uh, a lot of us do farmer's markets, except Candy doesn't often make the, gro the grocery list, so I've stopped doing farmer's markets. But it's that kind of thing. It's a one-time event or it's a recurring event. Um, and you want to get people to move past that event into your online sales or buying you in a store somewhere. Uh, and having done this for, what, five years now we've been doing, uh, at, I think our oldest event we've been doing for five years now. And year after year I get people saying, oh, I'm so glad you're back. I haven't had you for a year. I'm like, I sell my product to a store three miles away. Like, why aren't you buying me throughout the year? And so the difficulty is to move them from a face-to-face -face customer to an online or wholesale customer. Uh, so at the Philly Flower Show, uh, one of the difficulties we had or challenges we were faced with was how do I get a customer to go online? So we're only 10 days out from the Philly Flower Show, from the end of it. Uh, we've already been able to produce um, $500 in sales from, custom, from coupons that we had there. Um, we, we picked up about 100 e emails, which is great because we've actually never had an email list prior to this, even though we've been around for five years. We've never collected them manually or anything like that. Uh, and so we've set up the system by which we can do that and start kind of doing some of this email marketing to people. And we've connected with seven uh, retail partners, people like we thought there was no hope in connecting with because they were managed by a Sodexo or a, a Aramark or something like that. You know, the program has been great for us. What I like about the, the program is that it gets me to think about, intentionally think, because as, a, as an entrepreneur, like, I went to work yesterday, I produced for 10 hours, and then I came home and crashed. The day before, I was in the, work, in the shop getting out 25 orders to online sales. Uh, for eight hours or so, and then I got home and I worked for another three on the computer putting this slide show together and other things. All right, it's just, it's never ending. And uh, the thing I liked about this program is it got me to stop, to consider, to go out, take a look at other options, and to really um, bring in and assimilate other information from the experts uh, and the tours and things like that. So that, that's what I really got from this. Uh, the scaling, it came down to this, like 90,000 wrist wraps is just not doable. Uh, so we've identified uh, $80,000 worth of equipment, that's two pieces of equipment. One of them is like 70 years old. Um, you still manually place the cut caramels into the wrapping machine, except what, I, what takes me uh, 40 staff hours a week to do, could, it could do in two hours. Like, it's just a game changer. Uh, really, the next choke point is how much caramel can we cook at a time? Um, so we're having to find some way to uh, come up with the resources to mechanize our wrapping and our cutting. Uh, that's uh, gonna require us to find a loan and some financing of some sort. Uh, that will help us increase our staffing. Uh, I've actually been in contact with two people at the Philly Flower Show. They're like, oh, we're vending here. We hear uh, you might need some vendors, like some sales reps. We would love to do it for you. We're in the local area. I'm like, this is great. Uh, because, yeah, you know, I've gone out there and I've talked to other business owners in our same situation saying, how do you find people to work your booth? And most of them are like, oh, it's a friend or it's a disciple of the product who we know from doing these shows who loves our stuff and wants to do it for us. Um, and I also got the comment, I've tried 
you know, these employment sources and they don't work out, those employees don't stay around. Uh, so a Craigslist or a, uh, a LinkedIn or whatever. So um, finding salespeople uh, at the event, hopefully those two ladies will work out well. Uh, but we're really looking at increasing our revenue uh, through not only doing more of these marketing, uh, more of these events like the Philly Flower Show, uh, which was a major undertaking for us, not only in the production, uh, but a farmer's market cost uh, cost me thirty-five to fifty-five dollars, and the Philly Flower Show cost me three thousand dollars. That was just upfront, kind of getting there uh, and getting into it. And I had to buy carpet of all things, like uh, so. Uh, but then converting those people to online and corporate sales, and then uh, doing some of the marketing as well. It's just some basic stats from this year to last year. You can just put all those all the way up there. I think that's the last slide. Yep, there we go. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nikita. I'm here with Oxana's Produce Farm. Hope you're all excited to learn a little bit more about some more value-added business in Maryland. So first things first, let's start off with uh, who exactly are we? That guy right there, that's me. That woman right there, that's my mom, also known as Oxana of Oxana's Produce Farm. Uh, she was the founder and owner of this uh, farm. She founded it in 2013 over on the Eastern Shore in Maryland. Um, she comes from a long line of farmers back in Russia. We immigrated over here in 2001. Uh, so we've been farming for a really, really, really long time. She has a master's degree in agronomy. She really knows her stuff when it comes to farming. Um, I always helped out on the weekends with doing farmers markets and building greenhouses and all sorts of other manual labor tasks. And then a few years ago, I moved back down to Maryland and have been getting more and more involved with the business. So uh, as of last summer, I'm also part co-owner now as well. Um, so yeah, so our guiding principle is really that the earth wants us here. We really truly believe that uh, humans were put on this planet to be stewards of it. Um, and so our mission is really to help people reconnect with the earth and foster you know, gratitude for all the beautiful bounties that it provides for us. There's some cute pictures of Oksana on the tractor. That's our, one of our fields picking some radishes. So when it comes to value-added product, we really have three kind of different categories or buckets that we, that we make. So first, we have a lot of pickled and fermented vegetables, kimchi, krauts, pickles. Um, we pickled mushrooms, we pickled carrots, we pickle pretty much anything. We pickle daikon radish. Um, we have, again, a really long cultural and family tradition of uh, pickling things and fermenting things. You know, that's one of the, really the only ways that you can get vegetables in a cold Russian winter is if you uh, preserve them from the summer. Um, so we're experts in that as well. Um, we also, we do workshops, we teach people how to do what we do, which might not seem like a smart business strategy, but again, to our point, we really feel that fermentation is a uh, really valuable skill set for anybody to have, and it, you know, again, goes into that whole mission of trying to make people be aware of all the things that they can actually do with the product, with the food that grows out of the earth. Um, we also do agritourism. Uh, we do on-farm dinners. We did our first one last summer. You'll get to see some cool pictures of that. Uh, we also do educational farm tours. Like I said, Oksana is an expert in the field. She's also considered a soil health expert within the past decade or so that we've uh, been living on this property. She's been able to um, improve the soil quality, nitrogen levels, and all that good stuff. She knows way more about that than I do. But people always ask her for, for, for advice about soil health. <laughs> uh, so we also do educational farm tours as well. So this here, this is a lineup of our products that are available basically year round. We have eight or however many is in that picture, but <laughs> uh, as you can see, we put them in nice glass jars with nice clean labels on them. And um, what's really different about the type of kraut that we make, uh, one of the reasons that she first started making the kraut was, well, first things first, vegetables don't make any money. If anybody grows vegetables in this uh, room, you know that. <laughs> so as soon as she started the business, she knew that she had to come up with some other way to uh, make a little bit more money than just trying to sell vegetables. So we you know, relied on our family history to start making some krauts. Some of these are traditional recipes, like the pickled carrot salad and the pickled cabbage and the traditional Russian kraut. Those are traditional recipes that you know go back for hundreds of years in our family versus uh, some of the other stuff she just experiment with and learn how to make on her own. In addition to all the pickled and jarred goods though, we also, to some of our markets, we started bringing actual uh, prepared foods. So like uh, salads, um, you know, in the fall we make soups and stuff. One of the, we grow a variety of a lot of different vegetables that you don't usually see in a grocery store. So a lot of the times, one of the main questions that we get at, at, at farmer's markets and et cetera is, oh, well, what do I do with this? And so instead of um, constantly answering that question, we decided, well, let's just make stuff with it and give it to people. <laughs> We also do fermentation workshops. Like I said, there's a couple pictures of examples of what we've done. 
Um, we recently, we used to do one of these about once every three months at a PA Bowens farm down in uh, Southern Maryland, if anyone's familiar with them. But uh, last fall, we were able to actually move into our own production facility for the first time in our existence. So we have our own, it used to be a, a former restaurant, so it's got a nice big commercial kitchen, um, a nice big dining area. So we're using that space now to host workshops pretty much every other weekend. Uh, in order to teach you how to do the stuff that we do and impart all the knowledge that we have from generations of uh, making these fermented things. I know fermentation is all the rage nowadays, <laughs> which I know that there's a lot of health benefits from. I just think it's delicious. But on-farm dinners, so this is a picture of our uh, very first on-farm dinner that we did last year. I don't know if you can really see it all that well, but it's a really beautiful setting. <laughs> um, you know, I think uh, Kim mentioned something about uh, people are really trying to eat food that they know didn't have to travel thousands of miles to get to their plate, right? And so really the point of these is to, you don't, that food doesn't travel any miles. <laughs> it goes directly from the field to your plate. We think it's a really special experience for people to be able to sit down and eat dinner, you know, feet away from where the food that was on their plate was actually grown. And plus then you get to hang out with us, which is always fun because we're cool people. Um, so we're going to be doing a lot more of these this year as well, uh, hopefully doing one every month or one every quarter or so throughout the, throughout the summer. Um, yes. And then farm tours. So this is some pictures of a, of a tour she did last year where I think it was her, uh, a Lead Maryland cohort, right? Yeah, so this was a Lead Maryland tour that they came to the farm and asked her a bunch of questions about what to do, like how to grow stuff and all that good things. I, again, I'm not the farmer. <laughs> I'm just the guy that talks. So yeah, um, so some of the places where you can find us right now are in farmer's markets. You know, we're at a bunch of farmer's markets around the area. Um, we are kind of starting to dial back on the farmer's markets that we choose to go to because it's a lot of time and labor and our, um, you know, business ideas and business scaling plan is going a little bit in a different direction. Um, we can order our stuff online, the jarred stuff. We don't ship vegetables, but we do ship everything that we jar, um, which, you know, it shipped in a refrigerated container and all that good stuff. Um, really delicious. You can send it to your friends all over the country. We ship everywhere. And retail stores around the area, we're trying to get some more as well. We are in a few different grawls. We're also at Davis National Market in Gambrels. You can get our pickled mushrooms at Rutabaga Craft Juicery in, uh, here in Annapolis. Um, they make really good juices and also they make a really good sandwich with our pickled mushroom and onion salad on them. Um, culinary architecture in Baltimore, Honey's Harvest Farm in Lothian. We're really trying to expand a little bit more into a wholesale into like the Baltimore area. I live in Baltimore, so I'm trying to find more excuses for me to spend more time there versus be on the farm. <laughs> so uh, trying to find some more wholesale accounts and stuff there. What's next? Like I said, we're really trying to kind of get away from the farmer's market business style, um, really trying to get more wholesale accounts, and we really, really want to uh, expand this whole kind of experience aspect of our value-added producer or value-added products. Um, we really like talking about everything that we do. We think uh, what we do is really interesting and unique, and there's definitely demand for people to learn more about the way that we kind of live our lives, trying to be you know, cyclical and in sync with nature and stuff. So. Um, that's really kind of, as far as our scaling plan goes, that's what it is. We're going to do more events and we're going to hang out with our consumers and stuff more often. Um, and so that's actually one of the things that I learned from this program is, you know, before starting this, we had all these ideas of, okay, maybe we want to make millions of jars of pickled carrots every year or whatever. And then we went to a processing facility where they do that and I'm like, no. I do not ever want to do that. <laughs> we don't, we don't really want to, you know, we want to figure out how to really share, share our knowledge with people. And that's really what our business is about. Thanks, guys. Hi, everyone. My name is Megan Hines. I'm standing up here with my husband, Brett. He's really the, the ideas behind it, but I'm very good at the paperwork end. So I made the presentation, and hence, I'm here the one talking today. Uh, we are the Buzz Meadery. Uh, we're based out of Berlin. We have a really cool spot out there. And we're excited to talk to you today about mead, which you may not know about, but uh, it is an alcohol. We're the only alcohol manufacturers in this program. Um, and a little more unique because we're, we're very highly regulated um, and lots of loopholes around that. <laughs> so if you aren't familiar with mead, you probably know beer and you probably know wine, but you may not know what mead is. Mead is an alcohol made from honey. It's actually the oldest alcohol uh, there was honey in a bucket, it got water in it and it made alcohol and they were like, that's really cool, let's keep making it. Um, and you may have never heard about it because it's a very expensive product to make 
and we decided we're going to take that on and make this uh, as our business. So we know all about this, I guess. Um, we are doing a little bit different from what other mead makers are, are making these days. Most mead is made as a dessert wine where it's higher ABV, like 11 to 14 percent. It tends to be sweeter. Ours is kind of the opposite. It's carbonated. It's very light, somewhere in the 4 to 8 percent range. Uh, it's very refreshing. And so we live near the beach. We're by Berlin, outside of Ocean City. And so we wanted to enjoy it on the beach where we enjoy our days. Um, it is, of course, a value-added product because we're using raw honey. We use other fermentables like fruit, um, herbs, veggies, really whatever we can find. So our flavors change. We have about 20 flavors throughout this season. A picture of us, in case you can't see us standing here. Um, <laughs> we, we have two toddlers. Well, I guess they're three and five now. Uh, so two young kids. My son was born the day after we officially launched the business on paper. Um, so we've had two kids. We've had a pandemic. We've had all the things thrown against us, and yet we are still here today, so we're very proud of that. Uh, we also brought our, our only other team member. He's our brewer. Sam's here with us today, and so uh, we have, the three of us have kind of figured this route out together. Um, we are now standing here in front of you as not only a licensed winery, which is how you make mead at the federal level. We just became a licensed brewery, like I said, loophole, so we can get to do the products that we want to make. We're figuring that part out. Um, and even though we make a, an alcohol now, we have a very diverse background in farming. So Nikita, you were talking about vegetables not making any money. I get that on a very deep level because we were doing that. Um, we moved back from Colorado in 2014. We did pastured poultry out on grass until we kept getting salmonella, so we moved on to something else. Um, then we moved into raising uh, or growing vegetables. We were raising all sorts of livestock. That's a picture with Sam as well, um, and our, our lamb and our pastured pigs and all sorts of things. We've tried it all, and we've dialed in um, really on this business because it's something we enjoy making. We found that other people will also buy it, and it really connects that cycle together of um, having the Maryland, having the local growers, and connecting that to the finished product. Giving you a little bit of background on our journey, um, it's been very bootstrapped. So we're coming here today as business owners, but we used to be high school teachers up until um, January. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, very, very recent transition, but we've been doing this part-time, full-time for the last few years. Um, 2020, we opened our doors. Um, we started the paperwork process in January, really finished that in June, um, and we opened our doors to a, a production facility that's behind the liquor store and behind the laundromat off the highway. So it's, it's a little bit hard to find. We have figured that out. We need more visibility. So now we've, we've tried to move down into the town center of Berlin. We purchased that grass. Um, it's the last vacant property in Berlin. It's still mostly vacant outdoors. We purchased that in 2021. Uh, we've called it the Berlin Commons, and we have made it a little bit um, a little bit more than what it is now on the pictures on the bottom. You'll see that it has some outdoor seating. It has a fence around it. It has ha some shade cloths up top, um, but it's still outdoors and not quite an indoor tap room, which eventually is the goal. Um, and then we do a lot of farmer's markets. So we're direct to consumer almost all the way. We're in a handful of retail and restaurant locations. Adding on to that, um, these are our new labels. So we are expanding uh, very intentionally. We realized we can only do a, a very small amount ourselves. We're producing at the max maybe 10 to 12 barrels a month, and that's very small. So we're, the fermenters are my height. Um, we can only make so many things at a time. It gives us a lot of variety. We have a really high quality product, but we're very limited. And then the end cost of that product is fairly high. So that was our problem. We, we know we make something good. People like it. They keep coming back. But we can only make so much of it um, at the cost that people want. So we are uh, pivoting a little bit. We became a brewery um, officially like a couple weeks ago. Um, we got our inspection. And we are working with a local brewery, Evo, outside of Salisbury, um, to help can one of our products. And that first one is going to be Honey Light. That's the top label up there. Um, hopefully in the next three weeks or so, we should have product in hand and be able to sell it. Um, we're working through that final uh, label approval, but that should be a pretty quick turnaround. The one below it, Black Current, uh, we just got that design last week. And we're excited. If you are familiar with anywhere over 
our side of the bridge, you'll notice that that's the acetig, um, the picture of acetig, the marsh up top. And then on the bottom, you'll notice that's the Ocean City Inlet. So we are very intentionally focusing on what is local to us, not even just Maryland, like very hyper Eastern Shore. Where we're going from here, uh, we do want to continue distributing. We hope to get into Worcester and Wicomico. Um, this year, Delaware beaches, hopefully by the end of this year, hopefully maybe mid-Atlantic, that might be a big reach, but in the next year of mid-Atlantic. But we're also focusing on our roots out in Berlin and working on a tap house as well. So this is a rendering of the building that will go on the Berlin Commons. Um, the outside, we're still working on what that actual facade looks like. So this is really just the footprint. Um, but we're working on a, an actual tap house that can be open when it's raining, cold, hot, any other circumstance um, beyond just beautiful and sunny degrees, 70 degrees. Um, so the bottom floor of that will be a pavilion open, um, garage doors open to uh, our green space. The second floor would be a dining area, maybe a, a small venue area, and the third floor would be um, residential. So it would be a mixed-use building, which Berlin really likes. Uh, we're working on that. We have our first meeting April 5th um, to go through like the zoning and planning. So it's a slow process, but we're working on it. What our product currently looks like, if you look at the top picture, that's a picture of our bottle. It's a 22-ounce bomber. Um, it retails somewhere between 15 and 25, 28, depending on what... Um, what we're adding into it. So we have our 4% honey light. We go up to our, our honeycomber. So 4%, the honeycomber is 8%. But then we might have uh, raspberry, blackberry. We've done one with all five berries that we could find. We threw those in. We do peach. We have apple ciders in the fall. So we have a lot of different variety there. Um, and this is where we are now. Brett wants to add. I just wanted to emphasize that all of the ingredients that go into the, the products are all sourced from farmers on the Eastern Shore. So we took what we used to do trying to make a living with growing the vegetables to value add it. So um, that's where those come from. Uh, and the black currant does not come from the peninsula, but that comes from a family farm within 400 miles in New York that's pasteurized, ready to go into our products. So we are taking these higher end bottles that we have been producing right now to just get established and then what Meg's leading into is we're using Evo's uh, production capacity to scale up um, where we don't have to have the uh, the capital expenditures on our end we can contract brew with them for a more affordable product that is just using the honey and these other products that are already ready to go in these in these much more affordable cans that we can then distribute out so that commons building is both we will be um, supplying our own tap house to do the direct to customer sales and then we'll also set ourselves up for the wholesale distribution market great point so um, to add to that, the honey is also a Maryland product. It's out of Preston from um, Apex Bee Company. We did dive into beekeeping this year. It's very hard, and I'm getting help with that. It's not my forte, but I'm okay at it, um, <laughs> figuring that part out. But it's local honey as well, even with Evo. That's, that's using uh, Maryland honey as well. So we, we have a great product. Um, we're very proud of the look, the presentation. It tastes great. It's fun. It, it is easy to market if we can get in front of people. That visibility part is important. Um, but since we were teaching full-time and parenting full-time and also doing the business full-time, um, we were a bit unfocused. So that's why I joined this business growth program. Emiliano let me in a couple weeks late because I begged him because I knew it would be so important for our company. Um, so I am very appreciative. This is the very, the, all the specific things, but we couldn't make, um, we couldn't be as focused, we couldn't be as numbers smart if we hadn't had this um, experience of going through the program and networking and meeting people, um, not just our cohort, but all the field trips and things we went on. So we got a lot of specific feedback. We worked um, with Brian Brown very specifically on like projections and where we're going, as well as the other mentors in the program. Um, and so, Hopefully that will just help us be a little bit more successful, more focused in the future. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, My name's Amanda. Um, I own The Waterman's Wife out of Chestertown, Maryland. Uh, full disclosure. I am not actually The Waterman's Wife. Um, I understand that my name might be a little misleading. But um, my family's been in seafood for about 60 years. My great-grandparents started 
right there. Uh, there they are, Lee LeMay and uh, James Hunter. And so I decided to name my brand after my great grandmother. Um, I started doing farmers markets and making a lot of her recipes, and it just seemed fitting. So um, currently, I operate out of uh, farmers markets in the area. We do about four during the season. We're really excited to have a retail location coming in Chestertown, Maryland, and uh, we make a bunch of fresh and prepared seafood products. Uh, we usually have a full line of um, you know, fresh fish and shellfish, but what I'm really passionate about is the prepared products that we make. We try to keep it as local as possible and um, as innovative as possible because seafood's kind of missing that. With our growth plan, I started um, thinking about it really in the last year. We um, experienced a lot of change during COVID like everybody else, uh, but one thing that I noticed was um, a lot of people were more apt to buy prepared uh, products. And um, something that was different was an increasing acceptance of frozen seafood products. So I found that especially when I created things that people could just take home and pop in the oven, even if it was frozen, they were more likely to do that. And so that was pretty exciting because I was able to innovate some different products that you don't normally see on the shelves in, you know, Redner's or other national grocery chains. Um, so these are the three products that I wanted to focus on uh, moving forward. And we have the seafood pie at the top. That's a um, blend of shrimp, scallops, and blue crab with a cheddar garlic biscuit on top. And then in the middle is a oyster pot pie. And so that's just oysters and um, smoked bacon with a little bit of jalapeno. Um, and it's, it's not super spicy, no worries. And um, that is a puff pastry on top. And then something new that I've been working on is um, a fisherman's pie. I think like a shepherd's pie, but with rockfish and um, instead of meat and then a like mashed potato topping. So yeah, uh, even though like um, Emiliana was saying, I have all of, I have a, sometimes too big of a line because I get carried away. Um, these are the three things moving forward that I want to develop um, for my wholesale market. Who we're targeting is um, people in the Chesapeake Bay area. We're catering to busy professionals because, you know, pot pies aren't really that hard to make, but they're time consuming. So um, we found that out of all of our products, um, those do the best. And then um, for our business partners, we're working with a few um, small farm shops um, throughout the state. Uh, but we also want to work with more like seafood markets, independent grocers, gourmet food shops, and stuff like that is the market that we're looking at. Um, we're working on our branding right now. Um, it's a cartoon character of my great-grandmother, Lila May. We wanted it to feel homemade and comforting because that's kind of what we special in, specialize in is comfort food. And so we went with a more cartoon sort of um, look. And we're, um, much like the, the meadery, we're trying to focus on uh, regional symbols, like um, a waterman boot. You know, my grandmother used to, like, plant flowers in one and put it outside, and I thought that was pretty cute. So, um, and then, um, you know, like, very grandmothery vibe with, like, the, um, the needle point sort of uh, graphics that we're making, but we're still developing those. Um, our production process is... It's quite a few steps for pot pies, but, um, you know, we have uh, procurement, prepping, cooking, cooling, packaging, freezing, and distribution. Uh, we can make about 200 pies in about four hours um, with two people. So it's, it's a lot, but definitely worth it. Um, for a distribution plan, uh, in the beginning, I, I do a lot of it myself. I meet up with different um, stores just like everybody here. You know, um, but as we grow, we've been collaborating with a, a distributor out of Graysonville, and he has um, connections with uh, some supermarkets in the area like Aldi and Wegmans. And I am very far away from being ready for Aldi or Wegmans, but when I am ready, um, he likes our products. So it's, for me, it's just building up um, production. And so I, I really just took a look at um, what it would take to scale my business because we have the truck that runs to four farmers markets in the area, and um, that's great because I'm, there aren't too many seafood markets left. So the places that I go, they rely on me for seafood. So that's something that we're going to keep as we move forward. 
um, and then we're opening a re retail location in Chestertown. Um, so this would be the initial startup cost for the wholesale part of the business and specifically the pot pies. We would need two more employees. Um, we would need some assistance with, you know, some design, uh, the materials for um, the packaging, and then a tabletop food depositor would really help out. It's just, you know, um, something that could really expedite the process. And then um, the annual kitchen, kitchen rental for um, just manufacturing, like the pies and the food, the wholesale food. And so then I broke it down into, you know, like the financial forecast and um, basically first year we need to sell about 21,000 pies to get a profit. And then the second year, you know, if sales go up to 10%, um, it's about 23,000. And then year three would be about 25,000. So, yeah. Thank you so much. And I want to thank Emiliano and like this program. It's been super great being a part of it. I have a lot of things in seafood that I'm interested in. And so me and Brian used to, he has this joke that I'm like a squirrel because like I'm here and I'm there and I'm like, you know. Um, but so this program has been really beneficial because it's made me focus and it's made me really think about how I want to grow my business. And I'm really passionate about, you know, bringing seafood manufacturing back, especially back to Maryland. And um, yeah, this program really helped me develop a plan for that. So. I would like to welcome uh, Kevin Addix to the, to the stage so he can uh, share with us. Uh, thank you very much for being here, and thanks to uh, the center for the work that you're doing. I came from the land of value-added agriculture and want to give a shout-out to Kelly and Jana from Grow and Fortify, who, <laughs> who if, if you hadn't reviewed it or checked it out online, the, the uh, still only economic study related to value-added agriculture is posted at growandfortify.com. Uh, the reason I point to that is you're part of this. You're part of this industry. You're part of the $20.6 billion value-added ag industry and the potential of that industry. Um, a, a, as you know, you can grow things, you can make things, but when you're selling those directly to the public, when you're scaling up, when you're building a tap room, which is so cool, I mean, that's just phenomenal. Uh, to, to see that type of, of innovation and, and moving forward of this industry. When you do that, it adds so much value, not just to you as a producer, but to you or your uh, farmers who you work with. Uh, because as their prices go up, you're able to afford it because you're selling something that's not by the pint or the quart, um, unless it's ice cream, and please call me, um, or yogurt. I'll take quart yogurt. But y you're able to charge so much more. Um, I think back to the, the wine and grape industry, if you're just growing grapes, and I don't want to say just because growing grapes, any of you grow grapes, it's not easy. Um, it's a relationship with every vine, and you have acres and acres. Uh, what you can sell it for, you're not going to make a great living growing grapes. But if you make wine out of it, your per acre revenue goes from $1,000 to $2,500 up to sixty seventy eighty thousand dollars per acre but it costs money to bottle it it costs money to ferment it right all you're all in that same position um and uh, whether it's making sauerkraut or, or whatever it is that value adding of maryland agriculture is critical we've got some big challenges ahead uh we we are in full acknowledgement that any kind of farming any kind of manufacturing any kind of development of any kind that we do in Maryland uh, has to be in the context of the Chesapeake Bay, right? So, so we, we have that in our consciousness. We also have the viability of farms in our consciousness. So that's going to be a priority of uh, the, the Moore Miller administration and the Department of Ag is to make sure that we're giving farmers every tool that they can to make more money. Uh, I was talking to a farmer yesterday who said, you know, I'm, I, you know, I want to keep growing what I'm growing, corn, soy, you know, beans and, and corn and, and grain. Um, but solar companies are offering me $1,500 per acre. And I said, yeah. And he said, so what can I grow that is $1,600 per acre? 
So we need to start thinking about that, right? I mean, solar and clean energy, that, that's an you know, admirable goal. It's an administration goal. That's wonderful. But if we're doing that on farmland, and that's just, this is just one challenge, right? But if we're doing that on farmland, the farmland starts to go away. For a good cause, you might say. But you don't get the farmland back, right? It's different than putting a royal farms on a farm where you're, you're definitely not going to get uh, the farmland back. You might with solar after a generation or two or what, but we're, we're not going to be around that long to, to figure it out. So that's just one challenge. So you'll, you'll see our agency um, being more proactive on things like that, having discussions with the community in May, for example, and, and uh, our, how many of you are, are uh, grain farmers? Anybody grow grains? We've got one couple. Um, anything out in a field that deer like to eat? <laughs> <clears throat> So, um, you know, the, the deer are the, are the deer in the room um, because we, we need to figure out what to do as a state related to agriculture, but not just ag. Uh, we're going to have a summit in May where we're talking. You know, so we'll host the summit talking about deer, but it's not just about agriculture. It's about Lyme disease and the fact that uh, we're hearing from hunters who just aren't hunting anymore because of Lyme disease. It's too risky. They've all had Lyme disease, and they don't necessarily want it again. Um, auto insurance claims due to deer hits and deer strikes, right? So having a comprehensive discussion about it, it's like solar, where there's many facets and many sides to it. Um, but in the case of deer, they're really killing our, cro our, our crops and our farmer's profit. I'm hearing that. That's the number one thing that I'm hearing. Um, and they also taste pretty good. So we've got this wandering protein source. We've got huge food insecurity in the state. You start checking off the administration's priorities. I think we could solve it with deer. You know what else we could solve it with? Blue catfish, right? How many of you want to open up a blue catfish processing facility? Because we'll get you some money. Because they are helping to kill the bay right now. Um, it's an invasive species. There's a hundred, uh, by, by the recent accounts uh, and estimates, 110 million pounds of protein swimming around in the bay. Well, we could complain about it, complain that they're eat, are, are eating our oysters and our crabs and our, our rockfish and our sturgeon and everything else, or we could eat them, right? So we're gonna, you're going to see our agency beginning to turn from uh, regulating and, and you know, supporting farmers to figuring out, and farmers in the Bay as well, figuring out how to make it profitable. What's the problem? And let's solve it in a market way so that, you know, I, I guess my message today is we're going to eat our way out of our problems. So um, <laughs> can I get a show of hands in favor? Yeah, OK. Um, there's the other non-exciting stuff, like all state agencies have been uh, wound down over the last 10 years or so due to budget cuts. And so we have an opportunity while there's still money in the budget, right, Steve? Um, a little bit to start staffing up and filling vacancies. We were at a 12.5% vacancy rate. We're now down to 10.5%. So we're working our way through that. But we're a smaller agency. Every agency is that way. So when you call to get an answer and you don't get a response right away, it's because there are 30% fewer people in that office, 20% fewer. We want to get it down to you know, a, a manageable level so we can be responsive. So um, with that, I will, I will turn it back over to Emiliano and just say, reach out, call the Department of Ag if you've got uh, any concerns, any questions, any complaints. We love the compliments. Um, we love the mead, seltzer, as it will soon be called in your new operation, um, and, and everything else. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm also here for the hot sauce. So thank you. Kevin. Thank you guys so much. My name is Leo Gringuito, and I am uh, the Gringuito of Gringuito Sauce. Uh, our sauce uh, is produced in Falls Church, Virginia, and uh, we are a small business LLC currently with four employees. So I wasn't always a hot sauce producer. Uh, in fact, my wife and I actually are pretty famous Latin dancers. That's right. I promised I would only do one body roll. And that's the one you got. 
Over the last uh, 20 years, before I talk about the sauce, I want to tell you about what we've done uh, in the event and the Latin uh, diversity industry. Uh, we've actually uh, performed at over 750 universities with our Latin dance and diversity programs. Uh, we also uh, now have some new food programs we've brought to the market. And ultimately, as an entrepreneur, COVID hit, and we were just at home doing virtual programs. So we said, we like a challenge. Why not start a food business? Uh, I'd always been a foodie. I'd love to make sauces. In fact, I would give them away during the holidays. And uh, that's where Gringuita Sauce was born. So we went from heating up the dance floor to spicing up the kitchen. Uh, this is our annual conference in its 15th year. We get over 4,000 attendees. And you'll see very clearly uh, our uh, way of marketing is a uh, very unique because uh, we took the uh, the direction uh, of of event producers. So I don't want anyone to get too excited about all the dancing. So let's go, let's go back to why we're here today or why I'm here today. So Gringuita sauce, we have uh, four incredible blends, and as we learned in CIC, these are our four sauce skews. But we also uh, did something that we think is pretty creative. We created a. Uh, four very uh, unique uh, seasonings that actually go uh, with the sauces. So think of this as a flavor punch uh, to our four sauces. We wanted to do something creative in each of those seasonings to kind of give a little extra kick. So obviously in our cranberry, which we're going to talk about in a minute, we have cranberry, but then we added sumac. Uh, in our gringuita cilantro sancho rub, uh, which of course has cilantro, we did a little Mexico meets the Mediterranean and added mint. And these are great ways to get creative in the kitchen, uh, which is really important to our brand. So our four flagship sauces, this is our cranberry, all natural, five calories, five milligrams of salt, no added sugar. Uh, and this sauce, you know, we are really trying to brand ourselves more as a fiesta sauce because uh, you know, Kevin from Shark Tank said he'll never invest in a hot sauce, but we don't like him anyway. But we're re really branding ourselves as a fiesta sauce. And in doing that, we're putting ourselves uh, in, in a unique category. So uh, this is an incredible sauce, uh, great on red meat if you're a vegetarian, great on tofu. Cilantro Sancho, uh, this is a great way to add zest to a meal. We have cilantro, tomatillos, and of course our jalapeno uh, blend. Pineapple brings you right back to the beaches. Uh, this is incredible on shrimp. It's a pineapple blood orange blend. And for the garlic lovers in the house, any garlic lovers out there? Yeah. So uh, this may scale at some point, but at the point we are right now, every case of uh, Gringuito's Triple G garlic glaze has about a half a pound of garlic. So uh, it will uh, ward off uh, vampires and uh, is definitely a big punch of garlic if uh, you do enjoy garlic. We are a fun family forward brand and we have fun characters. So we have a TikTok, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, some of the different things that we're doing uh, in regards to social media. But those are our four characters and we'll see those in a couple of minutes. So I think the trend lately has been people want food that is healthy, fun, and most importantly, uh, something that they feel uh, happy giving to their families. And that's something that we really pride ourselves in. Again, five milligrams of salt, all natural, no sugar, GMO friendly. So a whole bottle is 150 calories for any ranch fans in the house. About three tablespoons of ranch comes in at, I don't know, about 180 calories. So uh, you can uh, go through a whole bottle and still uh, enjoy the sauce. So we are finding unique ways to market our, our sauce. Currently, we sell on Amazon, we sell on our website. Uh, last year, we uh, did a number of farmer's markets, and we are selling our sauces at our live events. Uh, but right now, we're really using uh, the opportunity of our entertainment brand uh, to let people understand what a fiesta sauce is, right? So through our marketing, uh, it's given us a chance to creatively bring the brand uh, into different people's homes and, of course, connect to the industry that we already have a great connection with. Our festival gets uh, people from 50 states and 36 countries. So we said, why not be the only fiesta sauce in the world that also teaches people to Latin dance? So if you scan our QR code on our bottles, there's some fun lessons. And there's also some recipes. Uh, we want people really to get creative uh, when they're uh, utilizing our sauces. Uh, event marketing. You know, we have two major conferences every year. So why not have our Gringuita sauce be the presenting sponsor? We don't have to pay $25,000 and it's a great way to market our brand. So 
Uh, we use TikTok, Instagram. Uh, we have a sell list of over 6,000, about 30,000 on our email. And uh, that's how we've been promoting our sauce uh, organically in the uh, branding uh, that, that we have. One of the things we did, like any entrepreneur, we said, well, why don't we actually create some food programs? So uh, this is a way that we're actually traveling across the country to share uh, gringuito sauce. And uh, this is a Spice It Up. So at Spice It Up, we basically go to corporations and universities. Uh, they can purchase our sauces, but then we teach them how to make their own spice blends. And it's super fun. Uh, we have, for example, I was just at Laverne University yesterday, uh, right outside of Los Angeles, and uh, we did an Asian-inspired uh, seasoning. So this is a great way for people to discover food uh, and, of course, have fun uh, with uh, Green Gita Sauce. That was at the University of South Florida. Uh, the other show is The Hungry Games. Uh, this is a food competition show, and uh, again, this is just a lot of fun. We do a blindfolded baby food tasting challenge and a whole bunch of other nonsense. Uh, but again, people are having a chance to uh, interact with our brand, understand what a Fiesta sauce is, and we do very uh, well with product sales uh, at, those, at those events. We do realize we can't just sell to our own industry if we are going to grow. So we are uh, very excited about uh, a new partnership that we actually started about six months ago with uh, diet to go They're actually the third largest producer of meal preps in the United States. So they produce somewhere up to 55,000 meals a week, and uh, they're in Ashburn, Virginia. And we worked a, a deal with them, basically creating a lifestyle experience, which is really what we're trying to do with Green Gita Sauce. So, for example, if you sign up at diet to go if you go to our Shake That Up Meals uh, site, uh, you get a deal, you get some Latin dance lessons, and you also get uh, one or two of our complimentary seasonings. So this has given us an opportunity to uh, get new clientele, uh, and they are interested in using some of our sauce blends in, in future uh, meals that they're going to be producing. So we are, uh, we're, we're very excited about, about that uh, opportunity. And uh, again, this is just kind of one of those promotions that we have to promote the, uh, the sauces. The final thing I'll talk about on marketing, we like marketing. Uh, you know, I don't know if you guys have seen the news, but uh, Adobe and Google have really AR is kind of going to be the next thing. So we love technology. So we actually have uh, augmented reality experiences with all the sauces. So if you come back, you can scan that QR code and literally the, the bottles come to life. Super cool, super fun. And it's a way, uh, again, to give people an experience with the sauce. And, you know, for us, uh, food is family. We really pride ourselves in giving back to the community. So for every 100 bottles of our sauce that is sold, uh, we give an opportunity uh, for a high school or college student to attend our Latin Dance Festival and some of the other ones uh, in the area. In regards to scaling, well, we are in a very tough position because as a small manufacturer producing in Falls Church, Virginia, we can produce about 60 cases in a day, which is a lot of work. Uh, but what we've learned through CAIC, there's not a lot of middle ground of s small to medium size uh, producers or co-packers. Co so that's our challenge. Our challenge is uh, to be able to scale. Uh, as an entrepreneur, since, you know, I was a magician at nine and been doing this for a long time. I, I'm always go, go, go. But I think this program has really taught me to slow down a little bit and, you know, because if we go to that big coat packer, you know, we might be at 300 gallons, and that's a hell of a lot of Fiesta sauce, right? So we have to really uh, take an opportunity uh, to look at what we're going to do and how we're going to scale and how we're going to grow. Uh, for this year, we're really focusing on getting into three to four small retails, like Mom's Market, five to ten stores, so we can see velocity and see how our product does on the shelves. At Farmer's Markets, pitching it, people love it but how does it actually do sitting on a shelf? We're gonna take that opportunity and then quarter two, quarter three, use our festival again to promote it, and then hopefully by quarter four, uh, we will have that co-packer in place and hopefully uh, get a pink slip. Uh, I wanna thank uh, Emiliano and CAIC for this opportunity. We've had a great time learning, and uh, thank you guys so much. It's a, been a great time, thank you. Hi, I'm Gail Galbraith. I'm the owner of Federal Brewing Company. It's an international award-winning kombucha company. Um, we sound like we're huge, um, but we're 
actually operating out of a closet in the Culinary Arts Center um, in, uh, in Denton, Maryland. Um, that um, space, we have definitely outgrown. We're looking to uh, move to, into a larger facility in Federalsburg. Our headquarters are in Federalsburg, but we're licensed to operate in Denton. Um, I started this business uh, shortly after I graduated from health coaching school, and I quickly realized that there weren't a whole lot of people that wanted to pay for me to tell them to eat more beans and greens, um, and that most people really um, are looking for some magic, a magic pill, a magic elixir. Hmm, a magic elixir, that'll work. So um, we started off um, thinking that we were going to have a craft beer that was focused on um, uh, herbal ales. So these were ancient herbal recipes. But then I realized it's too much like witchy poo stuff and uh, Eastern Shore really isn't up for that kind of thing. So um, I also happened to have um, tasted kombucha for the first time in 2015, um, which is really kind of a bizarro um, beverage if you've, if you've never had it. It's fermented tea. Um, and the first time I had kombucha was at a mantra fest in a temple. Okay, um, it can't get any weirder than that for how you tried kombucha. So um, my husband was still with his uh, heels dug in saying, I want beer. And I kept saying, I want booch. And um, so I actually did shadow a brewer at Eastern Shore Brewing. And I kept coming home and saying, oh my God, these bags are so heavy, I can't take it. You know, so um, I ended up winning that battle with beer versus booch. He still drinks beer, but um, not ours. Um, so, um, I, I, uh, my story is a little bit different than most stories um, with the evolution of the brand and the business because um, in 2013, we founded the company with the idea. 2015, I discovered kombucha. 2016, I discovered that I was not invincible. Um, in 2016, I had a, a stroke, and then within a week of that, I had 38 cardiac events happen in one night. Um, this would have taken most people down, but I had a lot to live for. I had a family, a mother who needed my help, children um, who needed my help, and I had a strong will to survive. So when they told me to go on disability, I said, it's not happening. So this is where I will always have a special place in my heart for the Culinary Arts Center because Beth Brewster reached out to me and heard what was happening. Now I had invested everything, all of my life savings into a building that I purchased. And I couldn't think, how am I gonna do this? And Beth reached out to me. And this is why community is so important. She said, stop it, stop it. Cause I kept stammering, I'm going, oh my God, I can't do it, you don't understand. I, I, I had a stroke, I can't do this anymore. And she said, we're going to help you you're gonna start off really small and we're gonna help you get the paperwork filled out because my brain wasn't even working right at that point. So Beth Brewster and her team made it possible for me to not only survive but th thrive. And um, since that time, we've all survived some really crazy times. And I think that the, um, the silver lining in all of that is that we do realize that um, health is wealth. Um, you can see here that our sales um, from a closet, we've hit six figures. And I'm really proud of that, but life is expensive. So we need to sell more, we need to grow, the demand is there. And I feel really good about the product that we're, um, that we're bringing to the public because it is helping to change lives. It's helping people, I mean, everyone likes, likes to drink, but some people are drinking a little too much. The kombucha is helping people with having an upscale craft beverage that will maybe help them, you know, slow down a little bit, help them to detoxify their bodies and to, as I like to call, drink smarter, not harder. Um, so w with that said, we've gotten into a bunch of little independent businesses and I know that anyone else who's doing that knows that that's really hard. We love the independent businesses, but they don't necessarily have the infrastructure in place. 
to tell us when and when they're running low on on uh, inventory so you're constantly having to go and check or call do you have it in stock oh oh we ran out last week you know so um, we're hoping that we're going to continue to support these small businesses but grow a little bit more and um, here's why it makes sense it's not just our business that is growing um, it is the entire kombucha industry. As you can see, in the United States, it's projected to grow 16.2% through 2030. There's a um, big drive for people drinking smarter, not harder. I think that during that pandemic, everyone drank way too much. And now they're, they're, re, they're reevaluating um, how they're living their lives. And um, they're really putting um, dollars behind life enhancing experiences and foods. As I said, our core value is that health is wealth and we're helping to um, get people to re redefine what wealth is because we've all lost a lot of people, seen a lot of people get sick over the last few years. And I think that um, in the end, people are realizing, I don't need all this stuff. I need my health, I need experience. Um, experiences with my family. I want more time with my family. And small producers, this is hard. We're losing time with our family and experiences with our family. So we're all trying to get to that next level where we're not just putting out fires anymore. And that's really where we are with our business, was constantly putting out fires. Um, so our unique uh, value proposition is that We've packaged our kombucha in uh, wine bottles. We're elevating the brand. We're using very high quality teas and ingredients. Um, I'd like to distinguish our brand by having people look at it as a substitute or an adjunct to, um, to wine. Um, and uh, we currently package it in 750 milliliter bottles. Um, we're looking towards packaging it in smaller bottles, potentially uh, 250 milliliter bottles. They'll still look like little uh, wine bottles. And also um, transitioning from uh, corks that we have to push down by hand. As um, Hope's Caramels knows, the risks go after a while, so you can't do that forever. So we're looking at having uh, a screw top um, bottle um, for both of these. Um, our kombucha, we did, it's a little geeky, but we did send it out for DNA sequencing. And it, fermented foods are pretty um, interesting in that they help support um, your health on a local level. So if you're, if you're making fermented foods in the traditional way, or fermented beverages, you're going to have wild yeasts um, and bacteria that's unique to that area. So, um, you know, we, we have a, a really wonderful ecosystem here in that the microorganisms that thrive and survive and are in these local fermented foods help to support our health because they're being exposed to the same types of uh, toxins and stressors that we are. So just like local honey is really good for allergies, local fermented foods are good for your immune system. So currently, um, we, we do packages in a 750 milliliter. We also have it um, on tap. Um, and um, again, we're looking to go in a smaller format. We've learned from our customer experience at farmer's markets, people want to grab and go. And um, so we, we're going to listen to them and give them what they want. Um, I'm also looking to expand our product line to include matcha blends and um, cocoa blends that have functional ingredients in them. So our core consumers, you can see, they love kombucha, but they are looking for balance in their lifestyle. And my experience has been, uh, as someone who did stop drinking, um, that there aren't a whole lot of options that... Um, taste delicious and don't feel like I'm a kid being put in a corner with a Coke. So um, I think that a lot of people um, need this product because uh, there's a little bit of a stigma with not drinking. So when you walk in with a beautiful bottle, then it kind of destigmatizes that for people. And they said, oh, that looks fun. It, what is it? And you can also mix it with alcohol if you, if you choose to drink alcohol. 
Kombucha life is good. That's like a, that's all I got to say. So um, the, uh, the the cake program, what that did for me was it opened my eyes to how much more I have to learn. So I think a lot of us think like you just have a great product. Wow, everyone's going to buy it. Well, there's so much more to just making a good product. Um, the, the other thing that um, Cake did for me is one of our um, our field trips was to Union Kitchen in D.C. Um, Union Kitchen, um, I'd never heard of, but apparently they're a big deal. And they have an accelerator program where they have, uh, I believe, 1,500 brands in their portfolio at this point. So what they do is they take in um, uh, brands that are exceptional brands who had to uh, apply for it. They'd only take in about 10% of applicants and they help to grow you. So um, they're looking to grow us into a regional brand. That's gonna require getting out of the closet. So, <laughs> so thank you very much.